Hi, welcome to the show. This is Mind Force, the podcast for love, life, and learning, where your mind matters. I'm your host, Nate Shear, and today we have a wonderful guest, Dr. Fred Moss, a life optimization specialist, which is awesome because this show is all about being the best that you can be. Today, we're going to be talking about being authentic, finding connection, locating your true voice, and becoming undoctored. And we're going to welcome you and everyone else to humanity. Okay, we're going to start off by the easy stuff. Who, what, why? Who are you? What do you do? And why are you here? Well, first of all, Nate, I just want to thank you for having me on the show today. It's just a pleasure. And I look forward to our conversation immensely. It's great to be with you. So who am I? My name is Dr. Fred. Um, It hasn't always been my name. I think I was born Freddy and then became Fred and then became, uh, I suppose, uh, Mr. Moss and then became Dr. Moss and then became Dr. Fred Moss and probably later became Dr. Fred. And um, like that's and there's a progression there. It's kind of like part of who I am. I was born into a family that was in a fair amount of chaos and disarray. I had uh, two older brothers, 10 and 14 years older than me. And my parents, and I was told later, of course, that I was the essence of my purpose of my birth was to bring joy and connection to my family. And I think I did a pretty good job of that early on. I think my brothers right now would probably argue that I'm not always done that good of a job, but I did pretty good early on. And, um, you know, it's pretty precocious. They were 10 and 14 years older than me, and it was the 60s. So I learned a lot about life um, before I even went to kindergarten. And I was reading, I was writing. You know, I actually uh, did a little bit of math even before I went into elementary school. And I went into elementary school really enamored and enchanted with the whole idea of what I later learned was communication, talking and listening and creating, you know, ideas from that and then creating actions on the back end of that. And I really wanted to be a communicator my whole life. And my elementary school teachers, there's not one of them who would forget having me as a student for sure. (laughs) Because I spoke a lot. I talked a lot in elementary school. And that was in an effort to communicate my ideas, in some ways mimicking my older adult um, role models. And so uh, I thought that I was going to learn how to communicate in school. It seemed to me, what else could they want to teach me? But it isn't what they taught me in school. They taught me how to sit down and be quiet, listen to the teacher, and regurgitate what they say. And that got worse over time, of course. That even got more tighter and tighter in junior high and in high school. And I became really, really, again, a little bit disappointed, a little bit disgusted, hoping that I could eventually learn how to communicate. And I eventually went to university with the idea that, of course, they would teach me how to do that in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at University of Michigan. And at the university, they didn't teach me how to communicate. I mean, Ann Arbor taught me how to communicate, but not inside the classrooms of the University of Michigan. I eventually dropped out and came out to California and, uh, you know, to find myself. I took a long drive on a bus, on a Greyhound bus to get here with my stuff and um, really thought that I'd find myself and had a good summer in a youth hostel in Berkeley where I did find myself, but it was not a sustainable living environment. And eventually my family uh, convinced me to come back to school and study a new industry that they thought I would be good in. Now, it had to be at the University of Michigan because the only actual um, tool that was required for this industry was something called a computer. And the University of Michigan had the only computer in all of the state of Michigan. So it was a two acre facility. It was a facility that was just built on, you know, batch jobs and punch cards. And I went in with um, the idea that I would maybe be a computer specialist. Well, of course, that didn't work either. And I eventually dropped out again. And again, even went back to California. Uh, I was eventually lured back after telling my mom that I would no longer ever go to university again. And I, um, you know, that it wasn't for me. I wasn't going to learn what I needed to learn. And she said, that's great, but you have to get a job. And she got me an application at a state mental health facility for adolescent boys in Michigan. I became a child care worker that year, 1980. And I really began to get communication and communication at the heart of all healing. I was, you know, I was interacting with these so-called kids who were only six or seven years younger than me and so-called mental patients who were only kids who were somewhat troubled about X, Y, or Z. And we were creating healing for each other. And inside of communication was where I learned healing actually emanates. The thing I didn't like about that job was psychiatry. And, uh, 
nevertheless, I, I kind of just felt like psychiatry was headed in the wrong direction. And I later learned seven years later when Prozac was introduced to the world that for sure it was headed in the wrong direction. In other words, the paradigm shift that was about to take place was this one called biological psychiatry or chemical imbalances at the heart of, you know, any kind of discomfort we're experiencing. And the illusion that a pill could actually fix uh, discomfort. And, you know, there was, Prozac was a big game changer. That took place while I was in medical school. I went back to school, finished off school, and then went to medical school so that I could be a psychiatrist because I wanted to bring communication into the field. Um, and while I was there, Prozac was introduced. And Prozac was, in fact, like a paradigm shifting agent. Since that time, you know, bio, uh, biological psychiatry has been the name of the game for psychiatry. And, you know, this po at this point in time, you can't get a job as a psychiatrist unless you're willing to medicate people. And, uh, you know, over the, over the last 35 years, that's the direction that it's taken. And, um, you know, it isn't what I want to do. And it's never been really what I want to do. But because I had sunken costs and because you know, I was in the field already, I was typecast and I enjoyed being the so-called thing called a doctor. I learned how to diagnose and I learned how to medicate and I learned how to do that well. I had, you know, over 40,000 charts that I have estimated that I've entered my signature in over time. And I've written over 100,000 prescriptions, uh, you mm -hmm. know, given all the refills, et cetera, and, you know, drugs that I've had contact with. But none of them have been aligned with who I am. I'm not, you know, I took an oath to first do no harm. And I was never really certain that I wasn't doing harm when I was prescribing medicine. So a few years later, 2006, I began to do something even more radical, at least it seemed radical to my friends, and that was I started taking people off of medicine. And this is where the whole idea of undoctor comes in. I, I really got that, you know, taking people off of medicine was part of the contract we made with these people. Once they got better, our idea, even if it was unwritten, was that we would stop the medicine. We'd get you better and then stop the medicine. But no one ever taught us how to stop medicine. So once you got better, we would instead use some sort of notion that, if, you know, why fix it if it's not broken or if this got us better, I might get worse if I stop and people would stay on medicine for a lifetime. I started taking people off medicine and lo and behold, they got reliably better, sometimes very much better. And sometimes their diagnosis actually disappeared. This was quite a finding to learn that the actual treatment was perpetuating the symptoms it was marketed to deal with. And I wanted to scream that out to the whole world, basically. I was really, really, you know, it was quite a finding. And I really wanted to get on the mountaintops and let everybody know, shake some people up. I later learned that that's not the best way to get this information out to the public. And um, I began to be a little bit gentler, less violent about my finding. And over the next several years, really continued to infuse the notion that communication is the heart of healing, not any kind of diagnosis or, or uh, medication. So over the next several years, I became a psychiatrist all over the country and then all over the world. Um, I started, I began to really see that I wanted to apply these uh, skill set or apply this notion to psychiatry elsewhere. My practice fold, you know, ended up, well, I would say it folded. Really what ended up happening is I took most of the people off of medicine, they got better and they no longer needed psychiatry. And, uh, and then I began to do that from around the world given the new um, impact that telepsychiatry was making on the planet. And I, you know, went to really cool places to learn how doctors treat their clients. And this included Nepal and Bhutan, Thailand, Israel. Um, I, I went to England and France and Italy, and I learned a lot talking to a lot of people, physicians and clinicians that treat people about what healthy, what being a healthy human is, and what so-called so the nebulous nature of what it is to be mentally ill. And then when I came back to the United States, I began to really be, you know, really see again more than ever that communication and connection was what I was after in order to help people heal. And that's where I founded the Welcome to Humanity program and also um, eventually earned the moniker of the undoctor, meaning that I undiagnose, unmedicate, and undoctrinate people, really get them out of the conventional system if they feel that it's not working well for them. And there are hundreds of millions of people who actually know that the system is not doing them the best. 
Now, let's make this really clear, Nate. If for the people in our listenership who feel like they have found their diagnosis and they like their therapy and like their medications and feel like it's really been a godsend or something like that, by all means, please stay on that train. Do not come off that train under any conditions. If you anywhere in life, if you have found something that works, keep doing it. I, you know, I'm not here to tell you to stop doing something that works. I'm focusing this conversation on people who aren't sure that they're in the right space and maybe sure that they're in the wrong space inside of the conventional mental health system. I've since written a couple books, one called Find Your True Voice and the other one called The Creative Eight, where we really help people find their true voice by rediscovering what really matters to them and then incrementally delivering that contact to the people in the world that are, that are uh, important to them. You know, like actually stop being someone that you're not in order to protect the person that you are. Like really go to your grave with your song sung instead of your song unsung. You know, I think it was, um, uh, I think it was Henry David Thoreau who said that the mass of men go to their grave in quiet desperation and, you know, go through life in quiet desperation and go to their grave with their song unsung. And I think that's what we're really after. That's a tragedy that we can actually take a bite out of these days. So here we are moving up to a present time. And uh, what I have is, you know, I have a course called the True Voice Course. I have a coaching program that's different than my doctor, you know, being a doctor, really transformational, restorative coaching, where I give people back their life back, optimizing their life by helping them find their true voice, communicate with others and connect with others and actually alter their mental illness from the ground up, frequently actually disappearing it as a function of being connected to another person. This is the combination of being the undoctor, being welcome to humanity, being an author, being a podcaster, being a keynote speaker, and all the things that I've become. So when you ask me who I am, I guess that's a little bit of a long-winded answer of how I got to be here. Perfect. Thank you for that intro. And one thing I want to highlight, I know we're going to go into it later, but it's funny how two people that you know you would assume are completely different are, are pretty similar. So my siblings are actually 10 or 13 years apart. Um, I had trouble in school because if you look at every single report card, talks too much, doesn't matter where you put me in the classroom, I will talk too much. Uh, my mom was told I have ADHD and I need to, you know, pipe down and be quieter. But the punishment I used to get in elementary school for talking too much was to skip recess. So the one time to get energy out and start to feel a little bit better, I was contained inside. And then uh, it's odd, I actually tried to go to school for programming as well and went through my first programming class. and found out that was not me just sitting in a dark room trying to program and you know break things and have to debug that was not quite the thing for me so it's interesting that if yeah. you try to find commonality you always can um, so thank you for that intro uh, we're going to move into the warm-up get to know you a little bit more um, what how would you describe yourself in three words um, I would say that I'm uh, let's see um curious i'm um uh intelligent and i'd say that i'm um a human being mm, perfect one one last fun one before we jump into the interview if you could have dinner with any historical figure dead or alive who would it be and why hmm Mm, any, right? Um, this is a tough one. I think there's a couple different people that come to mind. Um, Hippocrates comes to mind. I'd be really interested in talking to him and what he really had to say. The, uh, you know, I've read the Hippocratic Oath through and through before, and it's really a, just a remarkable document. Um, I would love to interview him and find out what he thought healing was about. And there's other healers as well that come to mind, Maimonides and um, Sam Hanneman, uh, both, all, both those guys, incredible doctors from the past. Um, and, you know, and then there's, there's many other people I would love to tap into, but let's just stay <laughs> with the clinicians for now. Perfect. Okay. And keeping in the, the theme of conversation, uh, do you have any questions for me? No, I think you're doing great. Uh, the only question is, uh, you know, what do you got next in this inside this conversation? Okay, so we're going to move on. How do you define authenticity and why is it essential for fostering, fostering genuine connection with others? 
So authenticity is a, thank you for the great question. So authenticity is really just um, having your thoughts and your actions and your words be aligned with each other. And none of us are 100% great at authenticity. So it's really important to get that we are always off in our authenticity. And it's not a matter of being authentic, like you don't really arrive there. There's always a little bit of a disjoint between our thoughts, our actions, and uh, what we say. How is it important? Well, it's a good direction to point to because what creates the resonance or the harmony between clients or between people in general is the idea in this world of connecting and communicating. The idea of vibrating at the same level requires us to be as close to our basic human being as we can be. And just like a tuning fork that's at a certain frequency, when we get close to that, that's what that's what authenticity is, sort of wiping the dust and the muck and the what cobwebs off the tuning fork of our of our soul, then we get to connect with other human beings who frankly are living at the same vibration as all as all of us are. And so if you're going to connect with someone, the closer you get to bringing a pure vibration consistent with your harmonic resonant resonating vibration the more likely you are to be to have the capacity to connect with another person which of course as i've said before is the um pathway to ultimate healing absolutely so in this day and age we got social media and you put something out there and you want all the likes and the hearts and the clicks and things like that how have you seen people struggle with trying to be their the real self instead of just trying to fit the mold I think almost everyone is really trying to fit the mold. There are some rules unspoken or spoken about how to, you know, how to post on social media. Um, you know, there's only certain things that you can or really can't do inside of some of these um, actual programs. You know, some of them are short videos. Some of them are pictures. Some of them are, you know, there's a sort of a style that's written, you know, what, what you can post or what you should post and how to post. Most people point themselves, you know, in a good light, uh, what, whether or not they're saying something good or not, even if they say something bad, they're trying to say it in a good way so that it's so that it's attractive to a great number of people. So the, the you know, when we do that, we've created a whole different context for why we try to communicate in the first place. Like right now, I'm not doing that. You know, I have, there are rules inside of podcasting as well. I have to watch what I say. I have to stay in front of the mic. I have to look reasonably good for the camera. I have to care a little bit about your question. I have to follow your follow-up. I have to monitor how the conversation is going. And all of that are some unspoken but real rules of the game of what it is to play podcasting. So because of that, uh, you know, we start looking at what is the reason to post in the first place? Well, you're posting so that you can make a post that makes a difference for a great number of people, typically. And the greater the number of people that you make a difference in, the more successful your post is. That's entirely different than how we generally communicate with another person. You know, it used to be that we really cared about each other and we, you know, might have sat with each other in the same room or sometimes spoken with each other on a telephone call, or maybe in the more advanced form in a video conversation. And the idea would be like we're doing now, attempting to connect to another person, hear what they have to say, listen to what's being called for, and move the needle forward that way. Social media posting is not used that as a basic context at all. Every so often a conversation will break out in social media, but still, you're realizing that several people, like the whole world, has access to watching and listening and being with that conversation, and that melds you and molds you into speaking or writing in a certain way, posting certain things that show you how clever you are or show how connected you are or show how beautiful you are or show how rich you are or show how smart you are or show something good about yourself. Even if, again, even if what you're saying is a complaint about the world, you're showing how good you can complain about that particular item. And so when we start really looking at that, we see that it has just changed the whole convention of what it means to communicate. And, um, you know, you called the world, I think you said molding. The idea is that many of us have stopped being who we really are. We start, we have a different place uh, to launch from. And we, in fact, pretend to be somebody that we're not in order to protect the person that we are. And I've asked a lot of people about that. And typically that's based on a fear, a fear of being disrupted or being dismissed, of being thrown off the island, of being misunderstood, 
being ostracized, disenfranchised, um, you know, causing more problems than it's worth by speaking your truest self. We've now reached a point, Nate, where we're some of us, and I think you can almost say most of us, actually sometimes say things that even we don't believe. Mm-hmm. Now, that's insane. That's, that's out there, dude. That is out there. Saying stuff that even you don't believe. Like, what drove you to that point? And you get that ne- ne- nearly all of us have had that experience where in order to fit in or in order not to be thrown out or in order to be aligned with the group that we're with, We might actually say or write things that even we don't believe. Or we might even say things like some, you know, like when we share someone else's comment, it's almost like we are saying what someone else, like it's another version of what he said or what she said, you know? And we we take credit. Like it doesn't, you have to get who posted this, right? Like if I post something that you, if I share something that you posted, I get credit for having said it. And frankly, you probably didn't say it either. You might have stole it from someone. And we act like we then said that which what someone else said, rather than using the creativity that is required to speak or be, um, you know, in real time. Yeah, I'm curious, like how people can be a little bit more authentic in their their posting. I feel like there's a lot of judging and things that you're worried about because it seems like a lot of times you post the vacation, you post the Christmas card, you post all the positive moments in your life, but you don't see too many um, where you're jumping on there and saying things that are negative, unless the extreme where you're just on there complaining all the time. So it seems like you have one end of the spectrum or the other, but. I wonder how the best way to try to convey real life, or maybe you can't convey real life in posts. Well, posts are a tough place to convey real life. And, you know, the first thing you have to do is get in touch with who you really are. So that's really important. Most of us, again, have really lost who we are. Earlier in our childhood, like you and I talked about early, like even in elementary school, you were kind of told to stop being who you were. When they took away recess, you weren't you were no longer able to cultivate that which was really important to you, which was to play and explore and, you know, dig around and speak and have fun and all those things. And so the crack in the cement was created when we were young and we never went back and repaired it. So we as adults are still struggling with the crack in the cement that was created by us being in many ways forced or coerced to be someone that we're not. If you're going to get in touch with who you are, you have to do the work. You have to get dig down what's really important to you, what's really matters to you. Why are you really on the planet in the first place? What's you know who are you? What's you know who are you um, with respect to other people? How are you interested in contributing? Or, and why are you interested in contributing? Are you interested in contributing so you can get all sorts of accolades? Or are you interested in con- contributing because you're because you're a member of a tribe called humanity or a smaller tribe of whatever group you are? And contribution is a very high level. Many of us forget how much we are social beings and what we really want to do is make a contribution to the world. And the way that we want to do that is be heard for who we are, like actually be heard and seen for who we really are and who we're really not. And a lot of us, you know, have, again, stopped trying to do that and almost just fall into a category. Many of us, even like political parties, you know, we're on a political party, we, we back a particular political party, and therefore think we need to back everything that that political party thinks. We have some things that, like, if you're right wing, then you believe all these right wing things. If you're right wing on any one thing, you're right wing on everything. If you're left wing on any one thing, you're left wing on everything. You just believe everything that the left wingers have to say. And you just instill that into your personality when, in fact, that may not be the real truth. You may believe some things that are left wing, some things that are right wing, some things that are neutral, some things that aren't any wing at all. And we wash those things out so that we'll fit in. And we work really hard to be the round peg that's getting shoved into a square hole. And if you really want to take advantage of, you know, communicating your truest self, the first thing you need to do is find out what that is. Rediscover, because you don't have to create your true self. Your true self has been sitting with you the whole time. And the ultimate goal here is to wash away the mud and the muck and the rust that's in the way of your true self. That same true self that was there when you were five and when you were 10 and when you were 20, uh, that's still there. And that's the person that we want to get in touch with as we communicate our truest voice, either online or in person with another group. 
It's interesting. You mentioned the thing about the political parties. Does that can go in a whole bunch of different directions? But one thing I find interesting is uh, if we're diving into social media and algorithms, you have confirmation bias where the algorithm is going to keep showing you the things that you clicked on once. So even if you begin to grow and change as a person, you know, you clicked on it at one point in time. So the algorithm keeps kind of feeding you the same thing. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting as we move forward, that's going to be a difficult thing where I wonder if that's going to stifle people and, you know, kind of shut down that growth where maybe they need to change their mindset. Like you said, a little bit of left and a little bit of right. But once you kind of go down the left rabbit hole, then, you know, it's all left because that's the way the algorithm works. Yeah, the algorithm is really defining and helping us define who we think we are. And, you know, it's not necessarily an enemy. I mean, I've been said before, you know, the Spotify algorithm is so fantastic. I don't have any idea how to even deal with it. <laughs> I turn on some song and I'm always just shocked that they know exactly what the next song is that I want to hear. And they're just so good. It's such an incredible playlist. And I enjoy every second of the Spotify algorithm. As much as I don't enjoy every second of the of the Facebook or the Instagram uh, <laughs> algorithm, which seems to serve me up stuff that I by chance picked on one time, and now it's kind of shoving me down that rabbit hole. Yeah, that's interesting. Some good and bad. Uh, so the next question I got, speaking of tribes, I'm really interested to see your thoughts on this next question because. I'm in the military and so I have to, you know, kind of conform to a certain standard, but I've always kind of been, you know, a little out there. So the next question is, how can individuals bring their authentic selves into a professional setting and what impact does authenticity have on career satisfaction and success? Yeah, so that's a great question and you know, it's funny. We th it's it, it's unclear why it would be any different in a professional setting than in a public setting. You know, the idea is that maybe fear is underlined as an influencer inside of the professional setting. The idea really being um, propagated here is that if you speak your truest self in a professional setting, you may in fact like lose your job or lose the support of your boss or lose the support of your employees, depending on your position. And so it seems like it's a greater risk to actually speak your truest authentic self in a professional setting because you're you know, your moneymaker might be affected directly. Not only might you be thrown off the island, but if you get thrown off the island, you don't have any income all of a sudden, or you get, um, you know, you get uh, fired or laid off or um, demoted or whatever might happen. So, you know, and how can, and what the question is, uh, the second half of the question was career. How can it, or how does it impact career satisfaction and success? Do you see yeah. that being a positive or negative? Right. So, you know, the more authentic you are, the more life satisfaction will grow. As simple as that. And the more inauthentic you are, you have a little meter inside of you that knows when you're saying stuff that you're not aligned with, knows when you're not speaking and you should, and knows when you're speaking too much and you shouldn't, knows when you're making a difference in a positive direction and knows when you're likely to make a di difference in a negative direction. And the more authentic you bring your life, the more aligned with your truest heart and soul, your core values that you're speaking, your thoughts and your actions are aligned with, the more likely you are to actually have a life that's working, you know, to actually have a satisfying life. In fact, I'm not positive that authenticity isn't maybe the number one thing that's required to have a life that works. If you're making a lot of money and even have a lot of like, um, you know, a lot of prestige or a lot of girlfriends or a lot of cars or a lot of whatever you think you have and you're not being authentic, you're not going to live a very, authentic, a very satisfying life, even with all those uh, external circumstances in your space. But when you're living an authentic life and earning, earning whatever is due to you, like whatever um, consistent with the life you're, you're uh, delivering and it's resonating with your, you know, harmonically with your core self, that's the a recipe for a life that works. And that's a recipe for a career and life satisfaction in my very real opinion. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it makes me think of a lot of celebrities. I'm not going to mention any specific names or anything, but we've seen time and time again where people, you know, are on successful shows or movies, millions of dollars traveling the world, uh, but they kind of have that facade or they feel a little fake. And so, you know, later on, usually many years later, they write a book or whatnot and kind of open up about that. So definitely, you know, if you're not true to yourself, I think that's a huge problem. And this is going to kind of transition into our next point. So I'm in a leadership role. 
And so I've seen uh, this topic of vulnerability come up. We, you know, Brene Brown has done some videos and things like that. And it's something I think that's super important. It's difficult, I think, especially being in the military, we're A-type personality, supposed to be strong, supposed to be, you know, whatever, pull ourselves up and take care of ourselves. But vulnerability, I think, has really gone a long way for me. Um, cause it seems like there's a little bit of a divide sometimes between the leadership role and, you know, the people actually getting it done. And so sometimes it's frustrating cause we're all people, we all have good days and bad days. And I remember going through training and I very specifically remember, uh, we were told you will have no bad days, which is just an insane you know, thought to not have any bad days ever. Cause they were trying to say you'd poison the well and, you know, bring everyone else down. But I've noticed like when I brought up things of you know, having difficulties in life, uh, I've been divorced and, you know, I have uh, child custody stuff and I, you know, I lost my dad and grandma and grandpa and long list of, you know, different things. But I feel like bringing those up and being able to make those connections makes us stronger and better as a team, not weak and, you know, starting to crumble. So the next question for you is how has embracing vulnerability positively impacted your connections with others and your sense of self? Well, vulnerability is not the same as having a bad day, first of all. So it's important to get that there's a distinction there. Being vulnerable does not simply mean expressing I'm having a bad day. And the thing about having a bad day is you get to choose whether it's a good or bad day, no matter what's happening in your circumstances. Ultimately, I, this idea, I'm not sure what you meant by poisoning the well, but ultimately, you know, when you, I guess it's when you announce you're having a bad day that it might be contagious and other people might take the opportunity to have a bad day around you as, as a resonating feature. But you can have, you can be vulnerable. And what vulnerable allows you to be is able to get whatever is being served up to you in life. Good and bad, right and wrong, you know, um, calamitous and beautiful. Anything that's actually being served up is, you know, you can embrace as being part of your day. And then your response to what's ever being served up and, you know, including just acknowledging, you know, I was just around. I just saw, a, let's say, a cat get run over by a car or I saw somebody get hit by their mom or I saw somebody. You know, I heard of someone who lost their wallet or I heard of someone who died or who got injured or who got, you know, who knows, assaulted or many of the men and things that are not uh, not necessarily above board. It's not like the things that we are looking for to have a pleasant life. But sharing unpleasantries that are in your experience and doing so without without calling, without being emotionally attached, in other words, you are not your emotions and you don't have to declare it a bad day if in fact you saw a cat get run over and you saw someone be assaulted and you had a flat tire all on the same day. It doesn't mean that you had a bad day. Just bad day. It just means that all those things happened in your world that day. And you get to choose whether or not that translates into having a bad day. So I want to get really clear about the idea that being vulnerable is more the capacity to experience all those things and share them if it's going to move the needle forward in your conversation and not necessarily collapse them or conflate them into being the equivalent of having a bad or good day. Like your circumstances are gonna, life is gonna keep lifing and then you get an opportunity to, um, you know, to deal with that life and call it as you will. You can react, you know, there's things that happen like you're like, I feel terrible, I just saw a cat get hit by a car, which I have three cats here and I shouldn't say that as much time as I just said, I don't, I don't want my cats to be hurt. But, you know, if we say that I feel terrible and I saw, you know, I feel terrible. I'm having a bad day. I watch a cat get run over. That's not really true. You're not having a bad day because the cat is getting run over. You've just taken it upon yourself to have that be the reaction that you chose for the cat being run over. A cat got run over. It's not automatic that you, that equals a bad day. It's automatic that a cat got run over. That's something that actually happened. But it doesn't have to be translated. Vulnerability doesn't have to be translated to blanketing yourself with your reactive feelings. You have an opportunity to choose your response, which is good, you know, a really powerful thing to get uh, as far as what it means to be a powerful human being. Yeah, and I think that's one thing I've struggled with a little bit. I've always been kind of upbeat and happy-go-lucky, and sometimes people see that as, you know, nonchalant or like nothing bothers me, but it's just kind of the way I've I've uh, lived life, but sometimes it seems to rub people wrong, like I don't care about anything. I still care. It just, I feel like life's too short to let anything take me down for that long. 
One thing I did want to mention is there's a short video by Brene Brown. I think it kind of sums up the vulnerability pretty well. She talks about sympathy versus empathy. You know, the sympathy is, oh, poor you. And then you got empathy where, you know, someone's walking alongside you and being in the the, the bad situation with you, not looking down upon you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that goes back to like kind of a reoccurring theme so far has been that connection. So yeah, exactly. that's definitely good stuff. I hope that like the situations I've been through, even though they're negative, I don't think of them as super negative because I hope that at some given time I'd be able to help someone else and find that connection. And so even though I've had, you know, these negative things happen in my life, I don't necessarily like dwell on it. I just hope that at some point I can help somebody and not to say that I've been through the same thing. Cause that's not the right thing either. Like, Oh, you know, I've been the exact same thing. I know exactly how you feel. It's not, but the empathy being at least to connect with some points, even if it's a parallel, exactly. um, but move Moving on to the next question, uh, talking about finding your true voice. What advice do you have for someone seeking to find and express their true voice, especially in this current world where it sometimes encourages conformity? Right. So we've talked about this a little bit already, but the really the way to do it is to make incremental shifts. First, of course, find what your true voice is. You know, what is it that you're really not saying that you wish you could say? Or what is it that you're saying that you wish you wouldn't say? What is it that you're, where are you misaligned and what would it take to be aligned? Really taking a look in the mirror, doing the work and getting in touch with what really matters to you. Like, you know, authenticity is so contagious and the opportunity to be authentic is something that opens up that door for other people. So when you're sharing with another person, share yourself as truly as possible. And when you catch yourself saying something that you're misaligned with, Take that moment to actually correct that misalignment. Announce, wait, what I just said is not really what I mean. And, you know, like fix it right then. Give yourself some compassion. Give yourself some acceptance and forgiveness and be aligned with that thing that you have now discovered yourself to be. You don't want to make big, bold changes, right? You don't want to make big, giant steps into thinking, thinking that you're now like super aligned with yourself. You want to try to make incremental changes and do it in a way that, um, matters by talking it and sharing it with the people in your inner circle who actually matter to you. From there, it can stretch out to, you know, establishing a new identity and it can stretch out to the people in your world who are more on the periphery, uh, people in your, you know, the clerks at the stores or your neighbors or your uh, colleagues or uh, even strangers. You start being someone that's more aligned with yourself and you'll feel that. There's a sense of really a beautiful sense of, Again, harmo inner harmonic resonance that takes place once you're being authentic. Now, the important thing is to share it. And the idea is that if all you're doing is thinking about it in your head, that's not really alignment. We think we're having, many of us think we're having conversations when we're thinking about things in our head. Uh, you know, <laughs> that we think that, and that's called a monologue and not really a dialogue. And But it feels like we've had that conversation, even though all we've done is banging around in our head. So it's really important to share it with another person and get a, get that they see something that you're finding about yourself. Again, the more um, authentic that you can be with another person, you open up the gates for them to find their authenticity. I'm sure you found that before. And one good example of that is, have you ever been around somebody that you're diametrically opposed to what it is that they're expressing, yet you can respect them because you know it's coming from an authentic space? Like there's a, you know, it isn't the content that we're disagreeing with. It's more along the lines, like we can still disagree with the content, but what's troubling is when someone is saying things and they're inauthentic. When, and that's when we really feel it. We have that meter that we're watching. We're like little authenticity police. And we're watching that from other people. And we're watching that from ourselves. And when we're authentic, there's a beautiful feeling of that resonance, of being aligned, of being uh, in tune and of being uh, of communicating effectively and connecting and again as i've said before and will continue to say probably to the day i die i believe that you know connection is at the heart of all human healing absolutely um i have a question i hate to make something cookie cutter because i don't believe sure. the human mind to really be that way but have, have you seen anything specific that is generally successful in this like journaling or quiet time in the morning or into the day or anything like that Sure. I think those are great two things. Those are a part of the arsenal to use. So there's, you know, there's mindfulness and meditation. There's uh, yoga and the grounding martial arts, for instance, and non-combative martial arts, Tai Chi and Qigong. 
Uh, there's, you know, keeping yourself uh, detoxed with respect to what you put in your body, uh, making sure that if you actually eat something that you shouldn't have eaten, that you get that washed out one way or another. Frequently, that means drinking a lot of very clean water. And another thing, you know, putting organic food into your body and really watching what you become. If You know, Cheetos are sure tasty, but they don't have to become part of who you are as a person. And, uh, you know, and if you do eat some Cheetos, it's fine. Enjoy them. But then realize that it's, you know, there's some toxicity there. And that's true with the drugs that you take in as well. And not only the stuff you take in in your mouth, the stuff you take in in your eyes and the stuff you take in in your ears and the people that you're around, there's toxicity everywhere. The air that we breathe, et cetera. So keep yourself as detoxified as possible. And then you want to, you know, really monitor like your walks in nature, for instance, this is, uh, you know, being out in nature and seeing how nature was intended to roll will be a distinct difference from how the computer is intended to roll. We are living in a computer age where we think reality is taking place in the screen that we're sharing. And that isn't really the only reality out there. You know, squirrels aren't really watching the computer quite yet. And this is also true with hummingbirds. This is true with um, plants and trees. They're not very worried about what the next post is on TikTok, for instance. And that's because you don't need to have that in order to have reality. There's a cycle out there. There's a, there's a flow going on. How a river flows is how a river flows. And it can be really therapeutic to be around that. Another thing you want to do, consider, is um, you know, getting that sleep of yours put into the space. So you want to be able to rest and relax and do so in a way that works. And one thing you might want to do with that is like decrease your screen time going into bedtime. Uh, you know, the number one, at least number one or number two enemy to sleep is light, right? We already know that. And what do you do when you want to wake someone up? You turn on the light. And what we're doing, you and I right now, we're acting like we're with each other, but actually both of us are staring and not even blinking at millions of lights. This is the enemy to sleep. And so when we watch our computer or look at that little phone of ours or watch the TV uh, right up until bedtime, we are feeding ourselves anti-sleep, um, you know, anti-sleep agents. And then thinking that if we put our head on our pillow, that should be enough to get us proper sleep. <laughs> Insomnia and having difficulty sleeping is like the number one complaint in America at this point. Um, almost everybody, many people are having trouble getting the sleep that they think they deserve. Then they walk through the day like zombies or they have to catch a nap or they have, you know, they're not awake or sharp enough during the day to manage the next day. Another thing that's really important is movement. So, you know, I talked a little bit about yoga and Qigong, but even exercise or walking, uh, these are important things as are pampering ourselves. So you want to be able to pamper yourself. You want to be able to do things that really work for you. That might mean getting a, med a manicure, a pedicure. It might mean taking a bath. It might mean, um, you know, they're like a warm bat bubble bath can be very comforting or it might mean listening to music or it might be, you know, like going um, to a museum or uh, being with a loved one, actually listening and connecting with your loved one, your family or your friend. And going along those lines, another thing that seems like is very important in this area is creativity. So you want to really be able to you know, draw on your creativity. You may think you're not a good artist or not a good enough musician or not a good dancer, but art, music, dancing, singing, drama, cooking, writing, gardening, all these things that require some creativity, you can do them. How do I know that? Because you can. After all, the next moment that you're living is requiring maximum creativity anyways. You're already pulling whatever strings you're pulling to pay attention to whatever you're paying attention to. That isn't all the other millions of things that you could be paying attention to at any given second. And that takes an immense amount of creativity just to live the next second. You are a creative soul. That's how you were put on the earth. And the possibility of even tapping a pencil on the side of a table consistent with some music or dancing as you might do to a sound that you're hearing either, you know, in your head or in real life on uh, radio or in maybe without even sound, like actually dancing just like the world, you know, like nobody's watching, as they say, or of, you know, singing or, um, you know, playing, uh, you know, doing, picking up a paintbrush or tracing or embroidering or knitting. These are things that we all can do and they have amazing uh, capacity to assist us in getting grounded and getting healed. Absolutely. And we always say we never have time, but if you mark on your calendar, you be intentional about it, somehow that the time always becomes available. Uh, 
I want to touch on one thing that you said earlier. One of my favorite books, Susan Scott, Fierce Conversations. Uh, so many quotes in that book, but one I, I just find kind of hilarious because you just mentioned it. But she says, we're having conversations all the time, and sometimes they involve other people. Exactly. Exactly. It's good. The inner monologue is always yeah. running. Um, yeah. So be kind to yourself. Uh, so I'd like to ask a question. It, supposedly with the internet and whatnot, we are more connected than ever, but a lot of people feel alone. So with the prevalence of social media, digital communication, how can indiv individuals maintain that authentic connection and prevent the dilution, dilution of their true voice in the online space? Yeah, again, the online space is very challenging and maybe not the space necessarily to cultivate a direct and honest human connection. Nevertheless, for many of us, that's the only space we deal with anymore. I'm lucky enough to have a wife who I love and who loves me and I have these three cats and they just provide some real time, three dimensional love and peace and fun and funniness, you know, humor. And uh, they're, you know, uh, the cats, the cats are amazing. I, they really are. We have the three the coolest cats in America that in all of the world, actually, the three of them are so great and so great to be around. And I'm lucky enough to have somebody I can hold. I can hold her hand. You know, earlier today, we were napping together just on the couch. You know, she had her legs on my lap. And it was just great. It was, I just realized, you know, how thoroughly lucky I am. Um, and that's where really human connection happens. Using this media to um, cultivate a human connection is pretty difficult. Now, I don't think that about podcasting, by the way. And my book, The True Voice, uh, Find Your True Voice, is written about podcasting, as is my course, True Voice Pod. It's called The True Voice Course, and it emanates from a course I used to teach called True Voice Podcasting. And the idea here is that podcasting really does promote human connection. That you and I are creating a friendship right here is undeniable. The idea that you and I could actually meet, have fun, have a drink or have a meal or hang out for a while. I think it's very clear that we both know we could do that. There's a real connection happening here. That's not true when you read a post of somebody, even if what they posted is totally charming. You cannot find out from a post whether or not you're connected to somebody. You can, might find out that you're in some mode of agreement. And if you read all their posts and you're like, I agree with 93% of these posts, maybe I could have coffee with this guy. That's still not going to get you the connection that you're looking for. You might learn the guy's a jerk anyways, you know, that he just, <laughs> you know, you don't know. Whereas here inside of podcasting, you have the opportunity to be a host or to be a guest or to be a listener. And all three of those positions create the possibility of learning about another person. And some, you know, as a listener, you get to learn about two people and you get to learn about our interactive styles and you get to learn something about humanity where you might already have an idea. And you and I, as we're having this conversation, are bringing new ideas to people that already had ideas about what we're talking about. And the only way we're going to learn anything is actually listen outside of ourselves. If we continue to listen from inside ourselves, all that we have to work with is that which we already know. When you start listening to somebody else, for whatever reason that is, and that's what we're attempting to do with each other, I'm attempting to listen to you, you're attempting to listen to me, and our listeners are definitely listening to us because they're only here for one reason. They're here to listen. They're not here to have this conversation, and they're not sitting here thinking, I wonder what I'm going to say next. They're actually watching two guys talk to each other, and this is an opportunity to listen radically. And from there, you can really get that, the, you know, the social media is not necessarily a space to navigate and cultivate uh, the growth and development of a real relationship. Whereas podcasting maybe even, uh, even offers an opportunity to cultivate a real relationship even quicker and more outstanding than what meeting in the real uh, world is. If we met in the gym or we met at a coffee shop, it's unlikely that we would have gone this deep this soon and uh, with this kind of intensity. And we get to do that on podcast. That's definitely true. So moving out of the digital age and into the real world, what practices or habits do you believe contribute to the cultivation of genuine and meaningful relationships? So the two things I'm talking about, you know, this, I think that the real magic sauce for that is in listening. And, you know, we're listening is more than listening to the words that the other person is saying, or even the mood that they're saying it from, or even the context that they're saying it from. But the entire circumstances, what is the space you're in actually calling for you to learn or to contribute to? 
Like, how is it that I can, what is it that I can learn from being in the space I'm in? And how can I contribute or be of service to the people or myself who are in that space? And, you know, that's what's really here is continually asking those questions. Like, what is it that I can learn and how can I be a contribution? And the only way we can do that, again, is by radically listening. What is really being, who are you really, where are you asking your question from? What are you representing? What's going on over there with you? And the more that I can be really curious and wonder what's going on over there with the other person, the more I'm likely to become aligned with what's here, offering something that actually fits what they're looking for uh, without having to sell my very soul. And at the same time, by speaking my truest self, and again, we've talked a number of ways to get to that true self, um, the opportunity exists to, to um, cultivate a real relationship inside of being with another person that is very difficult to cultivate in social media posting exchanges and a little easier to cultivate in, uh, or much easier to cultivate in a podcasting situation. And then, uh, you know, on real time, the, if you have somebody in your three-dimensional world, someone that you're actually have, uh, able to touch and feel and, you know, um, walk with or dance with or, or um, you know, um, actually be in their presence, that's a different challenge. And many of us become over-intensified, over-stimulated in that setting so that we back away from the relationship possibilities that exist in that setting. We, we're, it's almost too intense to create the kind of relationship that we would want. Here in podcasting, it's, a, it's an easier space to sort of fearlessly take on the risk of saying what matters to you and then creating a relationship from there. Um, in real life, it's not clear. You know, it, it becomes a little bit harder to, there's a lot of fears about how to manage ourselves around people that we're growing to appreciate or growing to um, uh, growing to want to connect with. Yeah, it's diff it's difficult out there in the real world. It is. Um, next sure. next question. Anyone knows me? I love storytelling. Probably tell the same person the same story too many times. Um, but how does storytelling play an important role in expressing you know one person's self and really fostering those connections with others? I think that so storytelling, you're right, is that the essence of what we do with each other. Almost everything that we tell each other is a story. If we were to, you know, almost everything we say about anything is a story. We made up whatever we made up. You know, there's this soul of ours that actually put in all of the extra pieces. All that happened is a cat got run over by a car. But we make up all the things that matters after that. Like what that really means. What about the driver? What about the cat? What about the owner of the cat? What is it about my day? What about the society? What about cars? What about, you know, what about cats in general? What, are the, what about, you know, what about this or that or this? And we tell our story to include all those uh, embellishments, you know, all, all the fabrications. And we're very curious and very interested in what people have to create. The truth is, it's our connection to creativity again. We're looking for creativity and responding to the way people see the world. When you tell a story, you're generally saying something about the way that you see the world around the issue that you're discussing, around the issue that you're delivering. And I can be really turned on by whatever it is that somebody else is saying about any particular issue. And in order for them to deliver a particular issue, if you just say, the cat got run over by a car, end of story, that's not even a story. That's just what happened. The story itself is the embellishment. And once you start adding your particular, you know, your particular um, uh, idiosyncrasies to the story, you become interesting. You become individual. You become somebody who gets to make up the next line. You're the one creating the sentences and the paragraphs and the ideas that you're trying to convey. And it becomes an honest to goodness human interchange at that point based on the stories that you're designing. That's hilarious. I hope my wife listens to this episode because she's always saying, you exaggerate so much. That's not how they said it. That's not how they did this. And I'm like, but it's more fun, right? Like you yeah. want a good story. I'm not trying to lie or make it incorrect or inaccurate, but I like got to spice the story up exactly. a little bit. But uh, I'd like to continue on this one. Can you share a personal example of a story that allows you to connect with others? Hmm. Do you have one you have a go-to? 
I, a go-to story. Um, gosh, uh, I have a lot or of stories. I've had, th- I've had things that have happened to me, you know, over time that are freaking hilarious and, um, <laughs> you know, kind of tragic. And um, there's, I have a couple stories of two major life-threatening car accidents that I was in. They're not as fun to talk about, but they're both really, they're amazing stories. And then I have um, the story of, uh, of a life-threatening, I had my, I had open heart surgery this year. I had emergency Ooh. open heart surgery this year and, you know, and recovering from an aortic dissection. Not bad. Not bad for a guy, right? For a 65 year old guy recovering from an aortic dissection. And <laughs> wow. uh, that, that's a cool story, right? That is something there. Um, I got arrested in a uh, in a Phoenix um, in a Phoenix Bashes uh, supermarket um, back in the day um, for uh, stealing a piece of salami. That's a fantastic story. Um, <laughs> That's an unbelievable story that puts me in, you know, puts me in the Phoenix system and uh, eventually gets me into Maricopa County Jail for the evening. Um, And uh, the holding tank for about six hours with about 50 people fitting in a place that held 20 comfortably and all of us waiting to get into the big jail. And these are not 50 pretty people, by the way, you can imagine. (laughs) And uh, they were pretty smelly and they were pretty uh, yucky and pretty terrible. And there I was with them waiting to get released into the big um the big uh, chamber uh at maricopa county jail and that that's a pretty cool story i've gotten um let's see what else i have a story about a challenge to my medical license it's very cool as well that i want to end up on the right side of you know um and uh lots of stories with women and lots of stories with moves and lots of stories with being another you know walking through the um the Annapurna Mountains, you know, up in uh, up in um, uh, Nepal, and um, you know, I, I'm not and not up Everest, but up the up the mountains right near Everest. We could see Everest at every other turn. That's a cool story, and you know, um, they go on and on for sure. But I, I'm I'm a guy who likes stories as well. Sorry for not telling you any one of them, but they're all pretty cool. No, no, I think that's, you know, proving the point of that example, you you can find that connection to others and find that shared experience. If someone is going through something good or bad, or, you know, you meet someone, the line of the grocery store or something, a conversation and a connection can happen because of all the different things that have happened, everything from jail to climbing the mountains to open heart surgery. Hopefully not too many people have that connection, but can experience that. Um, but yeah, as we move into wrapping up, I'd like to give you a final chance. Uh, what would you say would be the big message or takeaway that listeners uh, need to take today? Well, the big message to take away, and we had already touched on this earlier, is that there might be nothing wrong with you. Like it's entirely possible that there's really nothing wrong with you, even though everyone thinks that you, there is something wrong with you, even though you think there's something wrong with you. In fact, you thinking there's something wrong with you is more proof that there's something right with you because I don't know anybody who doesn't think there's something wrong with them. So that just makes you normal if you think there's something wrong with you. Now, Hmm. there might be nothing wrong with you mentally. You might be able, it might be okay to be depressed and anxious and even fearful or scattered or aimless or tired. It might be okay to be all or any of those things. Being uncomfortable does not mean that there's something wrong with you. We don't blame a log for burning in the fire. The idea here is that life is challenging and you don't have access to all of life. You do not have this shit put together. I promise. You just don't. (laughs) You just don't. You may pretend that you do. You may act like you do. You may have an image that looks like you do. You don't. You just don't. (laughs) That's just, and if you, and, and, you know, when you really start looking at it, you start realizing if you can embrace everything that's going on in the world, good and bad, right and wrong terrible, painful, miserable, beautiful, wondrous, ecstatic. Um, When you can get all of it as being what's just being served up in this lifetime of yours, you know, which is temporary in the first place, when you can get embracing all of life and managing as you do, just because that's the way you do it, there might be nothing wrong with you. And if there's nothing wrong with you, you don't need psychiatric care. And if you don't need psychiatric care, you shouldn't get it. And if there's nothing wrong with you and you don't need psychiatric care, you don't have to get it. And if you don't get it, you won't have to take the medicines. And if you don't take the medicines, you won't have to deal with the effects of the medicines, which often perpetuate the symptoms they're marketed to treat. 
So if you really want something wrong with you, go start taking psychiatric medicine. Then in a minute, there will be stuff wrong with you because that's what the drugs are intended to create. They're intended to create the symptoms they're marketed to treat. Now, this isn't a nefarious intention. This is just how the whole industry rolls. The industry rolls by creating and perpetuating, if not increasing, and sometimes causing the symptoms they're marketed to treat. Now, between you and me, Nate, that is a fantastic business model. That is fantastic. What a cool model to actually sell a product that gives you the problem that has you need that product to deal with it. Like it, it would create billion dollars a day profits if it really worked, right? Oh, wait a minute. That's what they got. So no industry makes a billion dollars a day in profits in a legitimate fashion. It's not possible. Those things are, do not go together. And what we're looking at in that industry, it's not like I'm banging on the pharmacological world. I'm not. They're, they're entirely entitled to do exactly what they want. It's inert substances. You can't blame the substances for the problem. It's for the people who think there's something wrong with them and desperately looking to have something fix them and have the idea that there might be a pill or a liquid or a intervention, a patch or a shot or something that can actually make them right again based on some you know human uh, design out of a laboratory. And truth is, that isn't how to get better. The way to get better is to accept life for what it is and what it isn't and embrace it all because indeed there might be nothing wrong with you. That's interesting. It reminds me like, the business model sounds like Congress, right? Congress asks if they get a pay raise and they get to vote on their own pay raise. Exactly. Who's going to turn that down? Exactly. No <laughs> kidding. It's, it's a nice, a nice inner circle, right? A nice, uh, um, vicious cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I encourage listeners to share their thoughts or questions on social media or email. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Buzzsprout or YouTube, but Dr. Fred, uh, thank you for coming out. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I love you all. See you.